Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us uh, today. This afternoon, we're having a uh, listen to a uh, panel of Landworks specialists. Uh, this is going to be an open forum. Uh, there's no PowerPoint. Uh, the whole objective here is that um, we can ask any questions that uh, may be pertinent to your your installation or your environment. Uh, we're going to go through uh, a bit of a um, uh, a bit of not a script, but uh, some talking points. Uh, of things that we've implemented uh, throughout the last couple of years of COVID. And uh, these are security enhancements uh, or other types of enhancements for uh, facilitating users working from home um, and just the change of landscape. Uh, I have with me to my left, I have Arthur, we have Rachel, we have Drew, myself, Eric. And without uh, further ado, we'll start it off with um, just a general question over to Drew that uh, with with um, customers having their staff working from home, what have we implemented at customer sites uh, that has enhanced their security from a remote worker perspective? So so the, the incredible upswing of having people work at home um, really changed the security exposure of, of people's networks, right? It, it really, instead of having, you know, all of my network is in my office and I have a firewall and I can monitor all the traffic that in, comes in or out of my company really easily, suddenly we have people at home and the office network extended to the house and it it caused a lot of, I, I guess, expansion of, we'll, we'll call it an attack surface. There's a lot more ways to attack people who are sitting at their house. There's, there's um, you know, uh, and it was a big explosion. It was all of a sudden this, this huge number of people working at home. So uh, the most common thing that we implemented to help improve security in that environment in that situation was multi-factor authentication so you know if you're sitting at home and you're signing into a vpn um that's nice how do we know it's you there are risks for having off-site vpn um there's phishing there's password scraping there's you know we, we've seen cases where there are, are um copied websites there are faked websites that they look remarkably authentic and you put a name and password and now somebody has your VPN credentials and there's very little to stop them if they know enough you know technical information to sign into your VPN and now they're sitting on your network and they can hack at your other devices and and work on your passwords your servers your resources so multi-factor authentication it's an app that works on your phone or it's a, a text message that you get sent to another device that's not your computer, that's not your name, it's not your password, that helps prove that you're you. And it's probably the the combination of relatively small effort, not that it's not always a small effort, but compared to a lot of choices, it's a relatively small effort and it has a really big impact on your security profile because it helps secure all of your points of remote access into the network that you know it's people from your organization who are supposed to have that access when they sign in. So not only with uh, uh, working from home, but everyone's migrating their mail now to Office 365. So again, that is another endpoint that you really, really need to protect. And we've been implementing MFA and making it mandatory for people to have MFA on their 365. Um, just as Drew was saying that if they get those creds, you know, not only are they getting your mail now, but they're getting your SharePoint, your Teams, your document libraries, um, all your data now is being uh, exposed and uh, they can actually put viruses up onto your OneDrive and whatnot and you can download them and get ways into your office as well. So very, very important to uh, do that, which leads into the other thing is how do you protect um, uh, your Office 365. In the olden days, we'd just have our mail appliance that would scan our, our documents and our links. Well, now you need to make sure that you're scanning your Teams and your OneDrive. So when you're opening documents up, they're actually getting scanned and that you know they're safe. So, um, you know, we, we've been rolling out the Defender product um, from Microsoft, and it does a great job of keeping things clean. What about um, on the endpoint from a security perspective, Arthur? Um, what if we, uh, some of the installations that we've done um, in, and security enhancements that we've done there? Well, I guess the, the biggest, I guess the biggest impact lately, it's been, 
EDR, XDR. Uh, it's, it's been around for a while and it really just, the, the whole COVID and then working remotely and then working from home really kind of escalated the implementation of, for a lot of organizations. What the EDR and, and XDR, so we'll start with the EDR simply because it's just an endpoint detection and response. And what it does, it kind of correlates and looks beyond whatever your virus scanner does before be, what your ATP or advanced threat protection does. This thing look at, look at, look, looks at the user behavioral patterns and then software behavioral patterns where it kind of, you know, if I'm opening up a Word document, how come I'm spinning off a PowerShell script in the background? Why is that going on? So that's where EDR kind of, you know, does its thing and it kind of monitors that behavior. A lot of people kind of used to do that with a SIM, where SIM would kind of correlate a lot of things together and then kind of you would have to go and monitor and then do the correlations yourself. What EDR it kind of does that for you. So it, 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 it kind of, it has the brains and, and the logic and an AI factor behind it where it kind of starts isolating these and starts notif notifying people. Where the extension of XDR comes into play, now we're kind of moving away from just the endpoint and now we're looking at the, holistically at your whole IT infrastructure. So we're looking at firewalls, we're looking now also as a lot of these XDR products integrate with cloud, they integrate with Office 365. So now you logged into your Office 365 and then suddenly your Office 365 starts doing weird things, you will know about that because the XDR will pick that up because it has a direct link. So various vendors now are, are, are getting hooks right into Office 365 security posture and they're correlating those events. Because again, without that, if you need somebody to go in and then look at all the events and figure out what's going on, I don't know, you need a team, like one person is not enough. So that's where this kind of falls and then makes it really easy for smaller or larger organizations to kind of get a overall sense of where am I in terms of security? And another thing is really moving that whole AV, EDR, ATP, all that into a cloud infrastructure, just removing it from the local network. Having all this on a local network was great, you know, 10, 15 years ago because the cloud didn't exist. Now having this in the cloud is much better because now your clients, don't matter where they are, they can always connect. You can always isolate them very quickly without even if so, if they get infected or if they get compromised, you can just quickly figure this out from the console. You'll get notifications and you can just isolate that notebook somewhere on the internet and who cares, never touches your network. So that's great. We're implementing new endpoint protection products for um, people working from home. But what other things have we done to our laptops? I mean, you know, again, because laptop now became really an extension of your network, like Joe was saying, you're, I'm, I'm VPNing in, I'm no different than sitting in the office, except the security boundary is lost because before I was behind the firewalls, I was behind monitors, I was behind a lot of things where people could see what I was doing. Now I'm outside, right? So what we need to do is we really need to start looking at that desktop as you know what as an entry point not only into the desktop but into my network really so now you need to start locking this down limiting the access so does the user really need admin right do they need admin rights on on the on the on the desktop do they need to uh, the ability to run powershell right now also encryption like i mean encrypting documents uh how do i deal with all this right so a lot of people that say, especially on the traveling side, when you have people that are not in the office very often, they maybe need admin rights on, on their desktop. They need to do things on their desktop. How do we facilitate that? So, I mean, there's a number of products. I mean, obviously Microsoft has a product called Labs, which is free, fairly simple to implement. And all it's doing is just basically rotating your local admin password on that desktop or on that laptop on the predefined schedule. So. If a user A calls the help desk and say, hey, I need to install the software, help desk can just go, okay, fine, here's the password. And then, and then the user name that you can log in with admin rights or, or elevate whatever you're doing, knowing that, you know what, within a day, two or, or, or 15, whatever you, your interval is, the password will change and the user cannot get in there again. Very quick and like I said, away from static passwords. Awesome. On the other side, um, there has been uh, 
a number of enhancements that we've done on SSL VPN. But just before we get there, Drew, I just want to stress if anybody has any questions uh, it, and um, want to post something, if you can use either the chat uh, or the uh, raise your hand and you can ask it, um, you know, ver uh, vocally. But uh, by the chat uh, would be preferred. And our colleague here, Bam, will uh, take those questions. But back to uh, back to you, Drew. We've we've really done quite a few things with SSL VPN enhancements. Could you kind of just walk through uh, some of those uh, that we've done? Sure. Um, almost everybody, I, I suppose, has been exposed to you know SSL VPN remote access. They go home with a client, you sign in, um, you know Palo Alto Global Protect, Cisco AnyConnect, um, Fortinet Forta client, uh, Juniper has a Secure Connect client, and, and they all give you a very similar set of functions pulse secure is, is another one one of the things that we've done with these clients to help secure access to the network is sure we use mfa so mfa says okay i know that you know you're my user and you're entitled to be on the network but you've been traveling for two weeks and you haven't updated your antivirus signatures in the entire two weeks and there's been three critical vulnerabilities come up and now your laptop is exposed to all these vulnerabilities on the network. How do we mitigate that? If you sign into the network and you're at Starbucks and your laptop is open to the rest of the world and you log in on VPN, somebody's compromised your laptop on one of those critical vulnerabilities before you get there. So inside of the SSL VPN client, <clears throat> we've actually been able to configure something. It's called a host information profile or a security posture check or a, a host posture check um, that validates a whole lot of choices and options around your desktop or laptop that you're you're remoting in from. So you can check, we can check and make sure that your antivirus client is up to date, that your antivirus signatures are up to date. We can check your Windows patch levels. Um, you know, we, we can check uh, domain certificates on your machine. Are you actually logging in from your corporate machine? Because we don't want users going home necessarily and logging in from their home PC. Oh, I left my laptop in the office and I need to do these two things. I'll just sign in on VPN from my home PC because I know how to download the client. Well, no, my host, your home PC doesn't have any of the antivirus that we want. Your your kid has been running, you know, torrent downloaders on it and it's got, I, I don't want that machine connecting to my network. So you validate that maybe it's got a domain certificate. If it's not the machine we gave you, you can't sign in on VPN. Um, you know, so you can validate that there isn't a PowerShell script running on it. Or maybe there's another security platform that you do want to have running on it. So you want to make sure that, you know, you've got an EDR client in addition to your antivirus. You want to validate. You can do all of that before your device is allowed to connect to corporate resources. Um, and it's granular enough that your VPN might say connected but there's actually no access to any corporate resources. The only access you have is access to go out and download your signatures and update your Windows patches and do remediation to put your machine into a state where it works. We at Landworks actually have, when I remote in from home, I get a little message in the lower right-hand corner of my screen that tells me whether or not my machine meets the current security standards. Our antivirus definitions can't be more than 48 hours old. Um, you know, if, if there's a, a a newer edition of an antivirus definition for for our uh, bit defender if their latest set of signatures is is more than 48 hours and there is a newer one we have to update it before we can connect just as an example so that's a that's a primary thing we've done with ssl vpn the other piece that we've done is something that we've seen a lot of places now is always on vpn and so what that means is before your machine actually lets you log in it lights up that VPN connection and connects you back to head office. But does that not prevent me? Like if I have no internet, what am I going to do? So there's offline modes for it where you can log in with no network. So you'll have access to your local files. You'll have access to your local documents, but you won't be able to use a network printer. You won't have access to network shared drives. You won't have, okay, you don't have those things on an airplane anyhow, if you're working, but you know, if you can't get onto a network to do things, there's no impact. But if you can't connect to the VPN, you can't get on the network. I, I mean, th there's real risk in this. It's, you know, a hundred bucks to buy a fake set of, of access points on Amazon 
and set them up next door to a Starbucks. And you sign on and see the Starbucks SSID and these access points are capturing every packet of traffic you send. How do you know? You don't know. You're in an Airbnb because you travel for work and you're, um, you're gone you know, two days a, a month to this city, two days a month to this city, two days a month here. You don't know what the Airbnb owner put in for their Wi-Fi. You don't know if it's secure. So always on VPN gives you the ability to manage and secure all of the network traffic from that device up to your head office. There's other considerations with it. Do I want to backhaul all their internet traffic to my head office? How many users are doing this at once? How much internet bandwidth do I have? I mean, it, there's a balancing act, but always on VPN does provide you the ability to do a lot of management and a lot of security with your devices. So that prevents me if I'm at Starbucks sitting next to you from essentially hacking at your machine because you've got an encrypted tunnel directly from your machine to head off. It's it's not perfect, but none of my data is in clear text, right? Okay. If you are capturing my network traffic off of a sniffer, it's all encrypted. You would have to you would have to break the encryption. But even that, I mean, at that point, if you know, if, if you disable you know split tunnel on your VPN tunnel, then really you have no access to this device. Period. Like you can't even if you're sitting on the Wi-Fi, there's really nothing because that connection doesn't exist. It's invisible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a huge, uh, like I said, there's a balance to it, right, with how much you put in and, and how much you don't put in. The, the offline part is, a, is a, good, um, a good point, though, Rachel. One of the things that we see now with people using O365 as an example, Google Drive is very similar, though. Um, all your files, you're on the airplane, nice. your OneDrive is still on your laptop, right? You, all of your OneDrive data is not just up at Microsoft. Every user you have who has sync turned on, if they're synchronizing that, they all have local copies of all of those files. So, and that that is why we tell yeah. people that you need to do encryption on your laptop now. It's if your laptop gets stolen or you leave it on the airplane, leave it on the bus. What? Without encryption, we can just you know, <clears throat> without credentials, I can just pull the drive out of your machine, plug it into my own machine, and then suddenly I have full access to your files. Okay. Easy. To go on certificates, though, I, I understand that you know it's it's painful for people to put certificates out on every single PC to vet to the validation, uh, the hip check that you you do. But it really, really is the easiest way. Group policy can push out the certificates; it can renew the certificates automatically. And for the consultants that come in, third third party, you just get a cert request from them, and uh, then you can put the cert on their laptop, and boom, they're they're connected to your network. So it, it really is a great way to protect that VPN client as well. So you're saying that you just talked about four different things, a username, a username password that's really difficult, and always on VPN, multi-factor authentication, and actually, sorry, grade three was tough on me. That was five <laughs> things. Uh, and uh, having a cert on your machine in order to connect to corporate resources. That really would make it difficult for a bad actor to get through your front door. Perfect. Right, just to jump in here, we've got a question from our friend Nick. He asks, can you explain how to incorporate mutable backup storage like Wasabi into your DR strategy? Who wants to take that? I mean, uh, I, I, I can jump on that. It was on our list anyway, so I mean, it, it's great that actually it came up anyways. But the, let's just let's just step back a little, a little bit. Just be, before we talk about immutable storage, let's just talk about backup strategy altogether, right? Like, I mean, how do I back up my data? So my data now sits in potentially two different places. One is my office, and the other one is the cloud, right? Are they very different? Like, well, people say cloud is, you know, they protect my data. Well. According to Microsoft, they give you access to your data. As to what you do with your data, it's up to you. If you want to encrypt your data or somebody else encrypts your data, Microsoft doesn't care. I mean, that's your data, right? So having a, and, and then, you know, if I delete something in the cloud, it's after 30 days, it's it's gone out of the recycling bin, it's gone out of uh, the email, it, I cannot retrieve that. So having a backup on cloud, it, it's a must, right? So not even from the compliance perspective, but even from just, you know, common sense that, hey, somebody deleted a document and then suddenly 30 days later, we cannot retrieve that document. That's, uh, that's you know, one. But isn't best practices is the three, two, one rule? Always need three copies of data. Primary copy is a very first copy. Secondary copy is another copy on site, but a different medium. And right. third copy is off cloud, offsite. Offsite, right? So again, Microsoft will give you already whatever, 
if you're using the cloud, you'll get three three copies of your data replicated within the data center or within the regions, depending on what you pay for. But then there is really no offsite. Like offsite is your responsibility, right? So there is an easy solution to 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 fix this or to approach this. Uh, and then now the second part is really how do I protect my data on the network, right? So a lot of people just have a backup server on the network on the domain backing up files. Great, somebody hacks, somebody gets into your network. Now they have access, they have credentials for your domain, they have credentials to your backup server. They can just log into your backup server and then just simply delete the backup jobs, right? Or if they have access to shares that the backups are shared, they just go in and crypto shares. I mean, we've done, you know, a number of ransomware recoveries and then, you know, mostly all of them were local backups were toasted. encrypted. Yeah. Yeah, they no, were, not all of them. We, they had, were toast. we yeah. had replicas, we had copies, which saved us, but, but the local primary backups were some, somehow affected, right? So there is a quick fix for that. I mean, you just, you know, take your backup server completely off the network, provide it with, you know, put it in a work group, separate set of credentials, your backup destination, whether it be a NAS, whether it be a SAN, whatever it is, again, completely isolated, not part of the domain. So if somebody cracks your domain, they have no access. A lot of shares are even hidden. And then now we can go back to the next question is, what is the immutable storage, right? So now a lot of vendors now are providing what's called object storage. Uh, and object storage really becomes a, a repository for your backup files, which is off-site. And on those repositories on the object storage, you can set what's called a flag, which is like immutable flag, where you can say, you know what, these files for one week, two weeks, whatever, they're read only. So, I mean, you can leave them immutable forever, but then why would you? Otherwise, you know, your backup files in the cloud would be in uh, terabytes and terabytes of storage after a year. So really what you need is you need the ability to recover if you get, uh, if your data gets compromised, you need to recover from yesterday already. So leaving that immutable storage for five days, four days, three days is usually plenty. Uh, and then all it does, it just puts them in the cloud. And even if somebody gets hold of your backup, let's say, and then go into backup and they try to delete those files, they'll just get an error saying, yeah, those files cannot be touched because they're immutable and they sit in the cloud. And you can recover from them fairly quickly. I, I think there's a, a critical point here, though. We we talk a lot about the cloud, and and I get a lot of assumptions from customers that the cloud is secure, and the cloud in most cases will guarantee you integrity of your data. Data you put in the cloud is going to remain in the cloud and be available for you, but in an awful lot of cases, it's not necessarily true that it's going to be secured. It depends on the service that you're purchasing. If a lot of AWS or Azure instances applications you might spin up. Um, you know, infrastructures you might build in the cloud, um, separate from backup, but but a, a lot of people are running applications up there, it's not necessarily secured. You need to take steps to have your own sets of firewalls, your own monitoring, your own other things to your data. You know, so you need VPN. You, you, need, you probably need VPN to it, but you're gonna need, you know, virtual firewalls. You're gonna need uh, other ways to address the security issues in the cloud because Otherwise, you know, hey, my cloud's available on this public IP that Microsoft gave me. Great. So the bad actor in, you know, North Korea logs into your IP and encrypts all your data. It, you've got three. But I have another copy. It'll be replicated. All three of your copies are going to be encrypted, right? That's that. They may give you three copies for integrity purposes, but they're not guaranteeing the security of it automatically. You need to address that yourself. So there's a whole set of analysis that needs to go. I, I just want to put it out there because you know we're, we're saying cloud a lot in here and you need to be clear on what services you're purchasing. If you're buying immutable storage, that's probably secured. If you're just buying instances in EC2 from Amazon and you're running up your own applications and databases, you need to look after the security. It's not automatic from the cloud vendor. It's, it's no different than running a secondary data center. If the cloud means somebody else's computer. Exactly. That's all it that's means. All it is. And we've got uh, more questions actually. This is more of a question slash comment. Um, someone asked uh, or mentioned encryption. Does encryption only stop or lock the hard drive itself? Can it stop ransomware or no? No, no. not at all. Because what happens is encryption only happens is when the drive is not connected to your PC, right? So otherwise, you will not never be able to access your PC or your hard drive or your data because it will be always encrypted. So what happens is when once you log in. 
the encryption keys are matched and the drive is decrypted. So now you can reinteract with the drive the way it's as it was never encrypted, right? So if you get ransomware, ransomware sees unencrypted data. Right? So to encrypt the files within your encrypted hard drive. Right. Yeah, so, you'll you'll then have an encrypted hard drive with encrypted files. <laughs> on it. So there is, there's two notions, right? So there's two notions of encryption on the desktop, right? So you can encrypt the whole disk, or you can encrypt files only. It's you know encrypting all files was kind of you know the old way because the disks were slow. Now with SSD, you just encrypt the whole disk and you forget it. So anything you write to that disk gets encrypted. Period, as opposed to specifying what gets encrypted. But that still applies to servers when you. Um, when you put a volume that uh, that has encryption, um, like BitLocker, for example, on it, as long as the user has credentials, that uh, data appears unencrypted. Yes, the, yeah, the encryption, the encryption, the encryption so it doesn't matter visible. local workstation, server. Right. As long it as protects that, someone from picking up that server and walking no. out the door with it. Exactly. So then another question related to this exact topic. Uh, can ransomware theoretically overwrite encrypted files? Well, so or could a bad actor? Yes. Yeah. What, so, so what yeah. happens is when you're logged into the computer, the, anything that runs with your account permissions doesn't see the encryption. The encryption is is a background process that is handled on the computer, and your account doesn't see it. Any other account that is allowed to log into your computer has the same thing. Those in, that encryption generally will not be visible. So if ransomware comes in and is writing encrypted, your files are encrypted, but the ransomware will end up encrypting it inside of your encryption. The encryption we're recommending isn't for security while you're logged into the computer. It's for security if you lose a laptop or if somebody steals a server, or if you decommission a hard drive and you don't wipe it properly, and somebody pulls it out of a landfill and plugs it in to see what's on it. If it's encrypted, nobody can get your data off that hard drive. But if it's not encrypted, I can pull any hard drive out of any computer, connect it to my laptop here in a USB cage and read all the files on it. That's what the encryption that we're recommending saves you from. It's a, it's a, it's a risk in mitigation. case of loss risk mitigation, as opposed to ransomware, which is active on your machine and encrypts your files inside of your protections. So if ransomware gets in and it uses your account and runs a, um, you know, an SSL encryption process on your drive, all your files will be encrypted. Your Windows process is then going to take all those encrypted files and put your encryption key on them. If I take the disk drive someplace, I can't see the encrypted files, but if I put it back in your computer, sure, my Windows will run its decryption process and decrypt all the files, but they're still locked in the ransomware encryption. Does that make sense today? Yeah. Yeah. Usually, yeah. I mean, usually, sure. if you can, if you can see the files, ransomware can see the files. Awesome. So one last question. We do, we do have more questions, but one last one relating to this topic would be: Who is liable for cloud for a cloud services data breach? The customer or the provider? Customer, customer. always, always. Like I said, any any agreement you you read from anybody, they provide. <clears throat> They provide you ability, facility, facility or ability to access your data from anywhere at any time. That's it. So when your Microsoft 365 credentials get compromised? Your problem. Your problem. Your problem. There are services you can buy in the cloud that people sell as secured services where that would then be their liability. But there's a whole different price point and a whole different architecture that revolves around those. And as you can imagine, it's generally not cheap because somebody else is assuming liability here. And somebody right. else is managing the access for you. Yeah. Right? So they, yep. they spin up whatever firewalls yep. and they start segmenting this whole thing. And then, so that becomes yeah. a security managed service. And then there's all kinds of things around SLAs and do's and don'ts and where the liability lies. So it's not that security isn't available in the cloud, but it's not automatic. You have to do the same as you would do in your data center that you own. You have to manage how that, whether you do it yourself or you get a third party to manage it's it for like you. Going E3 or E5 from 30 some yes. odd dollars to a hundred dollars. Yep. Month. The cloud is being sold on the premise that it's easy to use, and and, and it that's, is, and that's what people buy. <laughs> but easy to use doesn't mean it's secure. Right. Awesome. Moving along. Um, Nick had another one. Uh, it is. What are the best practices for running hybrid on-premises and Office 365 Active Directory environments? 
<laughs> it's a loaded question and it's a big one. So we're going to do our best to answer it. Whoever wants to take it, we're starting. Well, I, I think Drew's kind of, you have to treat them. Well, go ahead, Drew. Like, you have to treat them they're, 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 they're equally. You approach it from a security perspective as if it was all running on site. Yeah. So, you know, the, Microsoft has a set of best practices they publish for how to secure a, an Azure AD environment. Um, there's there's no end of, of papers on it, and there are multiple approaches to it, but you need to sit with, you know, your team or a team you trust or, or you know, your Microsoft rep or a combination of all of the above and sort out a comprehensive security policy that, that secures the cloud as if it was computers in your own data center. I, I know that's not a list of best practices that maybe what you're looking for, but it, it really does end up needing to be tailored to a customer environment because you can build this a lot of different ways and so I, I don't have a, a boilerplate for you for these are the six things you must do. But a lot of times, a lot of times it's, it's really, I mean, what we've seen out there is even though Azure's infrastructure can be accessed from outside, it really is blocked by most companies, right? So on the outside access, you don't really have any. Everything is routed through an internal VPN. So if you want to hit anything that's sitting in the cloud, you need to come in through a VPN client and come from the inside out into the cloud. As With opposed all to from outside the security in. features that Drew has spoken about as well. Right, right. right? Sure. MFA, like you, you, the, the it best, doesn't change. The, the root of all of the best practices is you want to limit your attack surface. You want to limit how many places an can attacker can see your network so they can dig at it. The fewer places you have that are exposed, the fewer places they can poke at and pry at, and the fewer places you have to do comprehensive monitoring and analysis, right? If I only have these three IPs that people can log in at and they can only log in with these clients and there's only, you know, this set of passwords that they can pull from, those are the places I have to monitor. If everybody has to come in through VPN, that limits it, right? You got a single door. I mean, in a sense, you, you know, you have a single door with whatever... Yeah scanners and people looking at who's going the, in and up. The high security practices we're seeing, people's Azure or Amazon or Google environments are 100% connected to their on-prem environments by VPN. And Clients are 100% connected by VPN. That That's what we're seeing from, from a, a maximum security approach. Right, and with those hybrid environments, your credentials in your local Active Directory are the exact Vaccine. same credentials in your 365 environment. So you have to protect even that Office 365 login page. Um, doing things like changing your home page, branding it to your company, that totally helps. So you get those fake login page and the users are like, hey, that doesn't have my uh, logo on it. That can't, that can't be my login. I have seen an Office 365 login page that was so realistic. They had a user who logged in, typed in their name and password. The page took the name and password, sent the credentials to the bad actor, and then sent the real credentials to the real O365 login page well and logged them into O365. So the user, we only found it by accidental analysis looking at the traffic later. The user had no visual cue whatsoever that they had been Well fished. done, well done. Um, you talked about something earlier, said the word uh, segmentation. Uh, we've done a number of projects uh, throughout the last couple of years where we've actually separated the uh, internals of the network and applied uh, policies, strict policies and, and application-based rules and such uh, to traffic to traverse these uh, VLANs or segments within the network. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit about that, Drew? Sure, so historically, we've divided the network, the corporate environment has been divided into um, the outside, and then you have your firewall and your intrusion detection and a mail gateway and then you have the inside and my users and my servers and my data and my databases and all my applications and what we've discovered over time is that well most breaches happen in the user side right the human element is where an awful lot of breaches happen so we need something because the user side gets broken repeatedly over and over it just is where it happens we need internally to protect our servers and our applications and our data from our users. And then it turned out that, well, if the users get hacked, 
some of the servers generally get hacked. So now we also need to monitor between the servers and their backend databases. So we call this segmentation. And so now we have the external firewall and typically we have one or a set of internal firewalls and we break up, you know, wireless LAN, wired um, servers, databases, uh, maybe a DMZ with web servers, application servers, telephony servers, uh, real-time streaming, and this all gets broken up and it gets segmented so that you have all these points of control between all of these environments. Somebody who's really, really determined and very technically capable is probably eventually going to get through all of these layers and all of these, but what we're doing is we're putting as many roadblocks as possible without compromising usability for your users or your customers so that you have the most chances to stop an attacker as possible and also the most opportunities to see what they're doing stop what they're doing or shut them down right like there's but doesn't so this sorry but doesn't this make my environment like require larger more powerful firewalls and complexity that our firewalls today are a hundred times more powerful than they were even you know five or six years ago i mean the amount of power in a firewall now is is so much more um, but yes, you can add complexity. I mean, obviously this needs to be tailored to your environment and your requirements, right? We've got some environments that have gone from 10 firewall rules to 400, but I've had other ones that have come down from 13,000 old style firewall rules to 350, which is much more manageable. There are tools as well arriving with this kind of build to assist with management and, and the firewalls are being built from the ground up now. The, the UIs that they use, the rule sets, the policies, they're being built from the ground up to support this kind of granular approach. So they have policies based on SQL or policies? Sure, you can you can base it on application. I might have 50 SQL servers. I don't need to write 50 firewall rules. I can write one firewall rule that says SQL applications that are valid are allowed to go to these 50 servers. And if somebody tries to send, let's say they find a critical vulnerability in SQL, that's going to be uploaded into the firewall's applications. If somebody tries to send a, a bad SQL request to one of your servers with a vulnerability, the firewall can see it and stop it as an application firewall rule. So, you know, that gets into segmentation. Segmentation is not just, um, you know, like IP subnets and, and firewall rules, though. It, it's, a, it's an operational practice. It should be extended to more things. I mean, Arthur talked about a little earlier with backups. That's a form of segmentation. It should be an operational and a security um, opportunity. So that's when you, when you, when you, when you, when we step back to that whole ransomware attacks. Most ransomware attacks are nothing more than just glorified PowerShell scripts that are kind of, once they've discovered your credentials, then they just go and map to servers, discover service, and they map at the SMB level, and then just run simple PowerShell scripts to encrypt <clears> data. With segmentation, for example, like Drew was saying, you have SQL Server. For SQL Server, I just need port 1433 to communicate, period. So if somebody tries to run a PowerShell script, map a map an SMB from a user network to a SQL Server, Firewall will just kill it. But it didn't we disable it. the PowerShell scripts on our endpoints now? Of course we have. <laughs> ah, just checking. So they won't even be able to do that anymore. That Absolutely. That was the one customer that didn't get the memo. <laughs> we have a question relating to what uh, you guys are discussing right now. A few actually, we've got a lot coming in. Um, so what, this question is to the whole group. What does the group think of the use of honeypods or intrusion deception? This is from our friend Dan. Do um, you want to answer that, Drew? Or like, I've got a somewhat of an answer for it. New kid on Why don't you start us off? Um, nowadays, the firewalls have such functionality in it that we really don't see many honeypot deployments anymore. Um, the, the the complexities in and, and the, um, the, the amount of data that the firewalls are able to pull in from the cloud, on-premise, endpoint, mash that all together, the databases of, uh, of deception techniques are pushed out every five minutes to policies on the firewall. So that's been more of the approach lately than honeypots. Um, you know, I don't know if you want there's, to comment there's on that. There's a different that. issue, and the, the different side of the issue is that no one is putting the same amount of development into honeypot technology as the bad actors are putting into determining that they're on a honeypot so they can discard that connection and go to the next one. That's right. Right? And, and that's an arms race that unfortunately 
the good guys aren't winning, right? But that goes back to the monitoring. But I mean, somebody needs to go and babysit this, right? Like, I mean, if something if something's going on, if you don't act on that alert, it's it's not that it's a technology that doesn't have any value, but I think it's a diminishing value. Um, yeah. And I think you get less return for your money than you can get in a lot of other technologies. What I, should, I should actually explain what is a honeypot, and that is, uh, picture your house. You, you would make a fake front door on your house. So you have your real front door, but you have a fake front door. But inside there, you've got a whole bunch of rooms that kind of lead to nowhere. But you slow that person down to the point they get so frustrated that they want to go to your neighbor next door. That's what a honeypot is. And we just you can also capture proof of them breaking into your house because you can right. have cameras in all your rooms, right? That's that, you know, but the people who know where your actual front door is, well, they never go to the fake door. So because they're supposed to be there. So that's essentially a honeypot. I mean, I have one at my house just for fun. But right? then when, when you go back to that EDR, XDR, I mean, that's exactly what that is doing, right? It's kind of, you know, looking at what's going on. And yeah. if you see something that's not going on, like, why bother? Just kill it. And it just kills the kills the session, kills the kills 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 the desktop or whatever it's trying to get it done. So that leads to the whole EDR. Like, isn't it almost like you let it run for a month or so, and you it learns the processes and anything unknown? Then at that point in time, can you just automate? Say, hey, stop that client from doing something. Yeah, it might be disruptive in the beginning, but it might save you in the end. See, the whole idea about this whole EDR, and especially with cloud EDR, is the size of the samples that are coming in into these clouds, into these cloud offerings, is massive. Instead of you know before you would have your network of let's say you had a large network and you had 500, 1,000 workstations. That's how big your sample set was, right? That's what you learned. Today you're learning from hundreds of millions of desktops. What's going out out there, and that comes in. And if it sees something that's wrong, suddenly that's being disseminated to everybody. So instead of an alert, why don't why don't you just kill it from the get go? Absolutely, by default, it's just again. I know people are scared. People are scared, and they want to disrupt business. Hundred percent. So by default, what you get is you get yes. Here is your ten thousand notifications that we found that say, hey, this is what we don't and like. Yeah, we got network. encrypted. But... Right. And by default, it's just when you set up your policy, the policy just says, Gee, you know what, just report on this. Exactly. But you can just go into a policy and say block, and then and then from that point on, you're done. Right. We've got more questions. Uh, no, than, yeah. Questions are good. Questions are awesome. Yeah. So uh, we've got another one that asks, so antivirus, firewall, fabrics are the only defenses against ransomware. What does someone like the military use to defend? Do they use old school honeypot traps? Does anyone, can anyone answer this question? Yeah, it, it, the closest it, person who can Canadian, answer Is it Canadian military or you want to go general? I, 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 I left the military 20 years ago. Yeah, um, so. so I, you know, my, my, but they typically, what, what, they're using the same technology as most other government stuff is. Are there honeypots? Sure, there are. What are they generally using? They're using a combination of um, firewall and security fabrics with integrated EDR, integrated antivirus, live um, threat feeds from multiple sets of security vendors. And you can build an infrastructure that pulls all of these things in and is live. So, you know, the, the, some of them, you'll see them called ATP or EMS or, or um, you know, a cloud threat feed. Um, you'll hear dynamic block list or extended block lists. And these are feeds that you can pull from the internet that are live in your networks, in your firewall devices, to your endpoints, to your XDR or EDR implementations that are continuously updated, right? And you, you have people watching. You have, you have live people you have watching. security operation centers for multiple vendors who are watching these live. And a lot of them feed each other as well. So, you know, just because you bought this from one vendor doesn't mean that's the only feed you're getting. A lot of them are very integrated. And so what happens is, you know, um, Palo Alto, let's say, sees an attack on 10 of its firewalls coming from this block of IPs in China. And then 10 minutes later, Fortinet starts to see the same kind of attack on 150 of its IPs. That, that information gets cross-referenced and really quickly gets pushed out to all the firewalls that, hey, here's a botnet attack. And every firewall in the world who's subscribing to the right dynamic feeds or extended feeds or has purchased the right live security feeds from their vendors automatically puts that into a block list on the firewall and you don't have to do anything. Exactly, you don't. 
I mean, right? you, that's the kind of technology that like if you want to talk about the government or the military and you're not taking your laptop home. And you're not taking your laptop home. Yeah. But also, the, a lot of this older technology was used to kind of, you know, put these guys into, a, like, 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 like Eric said, into a rabbit hole. So they stay on your network longer. So you can actually trace back and figure out where they're coming from. Now it's visible. Right? Well, now, now it's much quicker. You can get that information. It's no longer, it is. Oh, sure. It's all logged. The, the, right. the forensics are logged for you in the first place. There's no need to hold them in your exactly. honeypot for 10 minutes. I've captured it all in the firewall in the first place. 100%. Yeah. Also, the reality, though, too, is that to work in the military or on a military network, it wouldn't work for enterprise. It would be so crippling. Um, you know, people coming in, having their eyes scanned, uh, uh, body searched uh, for metal detectors. Like the, the military just goes through an absolutely different. Uh, yes, so, and so no. you think, uh, yes and no. Was it last year or two years ago where that whole Fitbit thing came out of the sure. underground go facility? And, the and as a as a counter to that, go to the e-structure database in Barry, and you need to do a retinal scan to walk in the door. You know, right. you can't walk thumbprint retinal scan. Now you're allowed in. There's no. Yeah, but once you're in, you can. Do sure, you want. but it's it 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 doesn't have to be crippling just because the security technology is extensive doesn't mean it has to be crippling either. I mean, there's there can be trade-offs between usability, usability, price, and security. Right? There's sure. there's three sure. corners of a triangle there. Yeah, that's true. All right, great. Uh, the next question uh, goes to Arthur or something that you mentioned. Arthur, you mentioned uh, monitoring your network activity. What are your thoughts, I guess all of your thoughts, on services such as Dark Trace AI, if you've heard of it? I've never heard of one. Well, yeah. Dark, Dark Trace is, um, it, it's essentially a, it's like Last Line or any of these other uh, on-wire uh, effectively, you're mirroring all your traffic to an appliance from all your VLANs, and it's doing analysis of uh, and looking for from its databases uh, for uh, bad actors, um, just malicious type of activity. Unusual activity. But that that is essentially the same as having you know enhanced or EDR on your desktops and all your endpoints. It's it's also having a next generation firewall that's segregating all of your VLANs and everything has to traverse and be inspected. So it, it it's a, it's another layer, but there's a lot of other things that you can do architecturally that Give is the same effect, very similar or does the, the same. Challenge. Is it more expensive? Like what what are well, the pros and cons? There's a lot of things. A lot of times when you look at monitoring, and I mean yes, you have you have point solutions that do a lot of things really well. It's just how do you correlate the, the, the events from right. all these different solutions, right? So, oh. so Sim will do something great, but you need somebody looking well, at so it. So right? last line, or that's or, why or, that's why when this XDR comes into play, right? And and again, I mean, it's just you know, is it you know, great invention? I think it is, and I think it's you know, it, a lot of like I said, is it mature enough? EDR kind of got to a point where it was, yeah, yeah, I think we have enough in there now. Now they extended it into XDR, where now they're taking feeds from all these other ones. Right. And, and then what EDR used to do very well, it had an amazing correlation engine, right? Right. And then it was one of the best. And then they kind of extended that into XDR now, and now they're able to correlate data points. But but for the specific question for this dark trace, if it if it's running the same way as, as I don't know the specific product, but if it's doing what you know last line or wireline yes. are doing, um, there's advantages to those because they're generally invisible to your users. There's no client on the the workstation, right. right? There's no it's it's an invisible. Um, but you need to have a network infrastructure that lets you mirror 100% of your traffic. So, so it's a bigger network investment. It can be a bigger network investment. It can require more powerful switches it can require or powerful equipment also to monitor. Yeah. yeah um and and powerful things to ingest all of that traffic and so sometimes there can be situations where you have multiple tap points and multiple servers and so depending on the size of your network and what your policy is on how much of your traffic is being dark traced or last lined um it can be quite an investment from a hardware perspective the other challenge with that one is it can be very difficult to monitor remote users Right, it's not as simple to monitor somebody who's connected off on a VPN, right. um, especially if you don't have um, full tunneling set up. Right, if they have split tunneling where they're only doing Talk. corporate traffic, then they have all kinds of internet traffic that you can't last line. You just can't do it. 
Drew, I don't want to uh, interrupt your train there, but we have like nine minutes left. We have one think... last question if we can get to that. Absolutely. Yeah, Very quick. go ahead. Because okay. we were talking about EDR, and it was just for reference to EDR. Do you think EDR, the EDR sensor, or if you want to call it that, can identify a root kit? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Right? That's... Well, let's, let's be careful. In general, yes. If okay. somebody comes up with a brand new one that no one knows how to spot tomorrow, no one won't identify it the first day, probably Again, the second day. But, but as long as what? Depends. It depends. It depends, depends. on the on yeah. the attack vector, right? Yes. Right. Usually, you're gonna for any attack, when you root kit, you you kind of you know you're starting something with 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 a standard set of applications, and you're kind of escalating within the application. You're yes. kind of spawning processes out of the out of the application. Yep. And unless those applications are using native application uh, native spawn processes. 100% EDR will kind of spit, spit out an arrow right away saying, hey, this shouldn't be happening. Right. right. Um, the one thing I wanted to touch on, Drew, is SSL decrypt. So that's important because so much of the traffic now that is traversing the network both internally and more so externally, it's all encrypted. Sure. And therefore, as it traverses the firewall, the firewall can't look and inspect the payload when it's encrypted. Could you talk to us about SSL decrypt? Sure. So 20 years ago, when you got on the internet and you went to serve to a page, the little browser, at the, the the address in your browser bar, always started with HTTP and a colon and a pair of slashes and your address. Now, if you look, almost every page you go to, even if it's not important, even if it's just a Google search, HTTPS, that little S stands for SSL. It's secure, HTTP secured. And what that means is it's encrypted. And you may have seen, you know, security things like Heartbleed that have come out where SSL was broken and it wasn't secured. Those are a big deal when you receive them and there's a big fuss and you get patches and they get fixed really quickly because that SSL encryption is the backbone of internet security. So it keeps your banking information secure when you go to your bank, it keeps your email secure when you go to HTTPS for Outlook. Um, and now on your network it's anywhere from 65 to 80 percent of your internet traffic has that s in the in the, in the address it's secured so, and what, what that means is yeah. when your firewall goes that was question, yeah. right, <laughs> when your firewall goes to check that it, it it can tell that oh you've got a page coming from facebook if there's a virus in that your firewall can't find it because if the virus itself is encrypted all the way through the firewall until it gets to your computer where the decryption is done and now you've got a virus and it went right through your firewall which has no way to see it because it, your web page is ssl encrypted hopefully all you need catch it you're, you're hoping but it might you know any kind of malware any kind of command and control anything you don't want on your computer can be sent your email can't be inspected your transactions files you download um, if somebody finds a way to infect an mp3 Somebody's downloading MP3s, boom, you can't inspect it. But if you're unencrypting all the traffic, <clears throat> are you not making that traffic exposed then? Well, there's two pieces to that. One piece is that decrypting all the traffic is a tall order. That requires a huge amount of CPU. You know, you got 500 users in your office, everybody's decrypting traffic. You got 500, maybe 1,000, could be 4,000 CPUs decrypting all of that across your office. You want to do all that on your firewall? you need a fairly powerful firewall, right? SSL decrypt can bring, even modern firewalls can bring a lot of them to a crawl with how much um, load it puts on the network. So you need to be judicious in your decryption um, from a performance perspective, but also if you're looking at doing SSL decrypt, yeah, you need to build a policy around this in conjunction with HR and privacy laws, right? You don't wanna be decrypting people's banking traffic. You don't wanna be decrypting their Government of Canada traffic. You don't wanna be decrypting, um, you know, necessarily um, health. health information. Gmail, you know, okay? Uh, Gmail's iffy, right? There are policies around that and you may have to write it in your acceptable use policy. I can't have an employee sending corporate secrets out with Gmail. So maybe I look at that, right? Maybe, hey, your email's not private if you're using it on company premises. But you have to address that with HR and in conjunction with privacy laws and with policy. Um, there's gonna be payment card industry implications for encryption decryption as well, depending on what you do. So um, it's gonna be necessary. Uh, the more advanced malware gets, 
and the more traffic on the web is encrypted and we're going to be approaching 100 percent over the next half decade or so um, you're going to have to put ssl decryption in place in order to protect traffic in and out of your network so just one, one more layer what has yep. to happen then is that you have a cert on the endpoint my notebook for example we have corresponding cert on the firewall so it acts as a man in the middle kind of thing yes. so it's able to decrypt it and then re-inspect it then re-encrypt it as it goes back yes again. so your traffic is never exposed on a wire it's okay. never exposed in transit nobody can plug into a switch and take a copy it's decrypted on the firewall and it's not oh, read it's 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 not read it's not you know oh i i'm not it's analyzed for patterns for data loss prevention for malware and then it's re-encrypted and sent and if there's any problems found your policies define whether it's dropped whether you're alerted whether there's a combination of both that happens okay um we're pretty much uh we're getting close yeah we're, we're getting close i'm not sure if there's any, any questions left uh, there's no more questions um uh, Nick just wanted to make comments saying that in regards to what you were saying, that that's why purchasing an SSL cert and applying it to a domain is a PETA. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> really, I mean, the only thing we haven't really touched on is, again, at the end of the day, it's the end user education, right? Like, it's yeah. just that's that's, and I think that in today's environment, educating users, because at the end of the day, it's this is who, who the hackers. Uh, go after right. It's your end users, Give, exposing them to various trainings and then various phishing uh, samples, campaigns, whatever you want to call that. I think in today's environment, I think it's a must. Like it's just again because users don't know. Like I said, you know, there might be you know they might hear something on the news, they might hear something on the radio, but you really they don't see it on their desktop. And then until you start sending this simulated attacks to them it kind of exposes them only then as to what the real world might look like. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the curriculum that you designed sort of around that? So again, I mean, we, we, we've been using No Before for a long time. Uh, and I think No Before is, is, is really, I think it's the leader in the, in the training and the, and the phishing uh, organ in, in, in terms of uh, product and, and the, the amount of material they offer. Very straightforward to set up. Uh, you, you set up your trainings. Trainings can be videos, anything from extended videos that, that last hours to anything that could be you know, a minute to a poster to just a reminder saying, hey, remember this. And then the, the, and then really the, it's the phishing or the vishing, which is the voicemail. There's also SMS stuff. And, and, it, it, and you really can expose users to something that, like I said, they don't really see in the, in the, in the real world, but because again, unless they get fished, and all it really takes is just that one click from that one user, right? So but if it's everything not else fails, all about just getting a password. That's no, it's no, what no, people no, need to no. realize. So password, a, password is one thing. It's exactly. just most attacks today, like you know, when you look at attacks, you know, whatever, 20, 30 years ago, people got onto your computer. Oh, great, I can steal some files. Awesome, I'll take this and, and I'll post a message. Today, people sit there, they throw something on your network, they sit there for months slowly slowly collecting data and then only when they have something that they think it's you know valuable then they'll go and get you so you might not even be aware of what's going on in the I, I think even the people on this call though i think a lot of people and and the vast majority of your end users i think they would be really surprised at the sophistication and the effort that goes into the phishing attacks the fake voicemails the fake sms's the social engineering it's much more complex and and in a lot of cases much more savvy and much more believable than i think most of us expect on a day-to-day -day basis and, until you're exposed to it and also i think it's because of cloud services now it's just so much easier yeah of course yeah, yeah. everyone's so, got the same login page everyone's got yeah throwing out fake login uh, yeah. Login, yeah. login pages throwing out you know safe links to documents and say hey somebody shared this document you know what i get you know eric's you know sends you this document click here Eric never sets documents, right? So things like this, I mean, and, and, and really that's that's user education, right? It's funny, one of our customers who you've actually provided the service for uh, made a comment saying it's essential uh, and it is massively cheaper than cybersecurity insurance. So 100%. Very, very yeah. 100%. Exactly. If you've been hit by ransomware once and try to do it again. And you know what? 
I can just just quickly for like you know 30 yeah. seconds, whatever. When we start the sessions, you know, when when we just fish people for the first time, you'll get on average between 25 to 35 percent hit ratio. Easy. Easy. Within a within two years, we've seen this drop to let's say five percent, four percent. That's, that's huge, that's huge, nice. yeah, yeah, huge. And then just think about it: that one click can cost you millions. You know, we we see in the news, and it's it's a critical piece for understanding on the education part. You see in the news, oh, there's this vulnerability. Or was you know, I'll use Hartley because it was all over the news for months. And but you know what? Most attacks don't happen that way. No, most attacks happen through user behavior. They yeah. don't happen through a technical vulnerability. It, 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 sure, it, it may be exploiting a technical vulnerability, but the way into that exploit is almost never just a random, I hit this IP address across the internet and it had this vulnerability and I got in. It's almost never, yeah. maybe one in a hundred. The other 99 times, they've exploited user behavior to open that hole to get in and then you have no control from there. Right. First. And then they're using, I'll just quickly, 30 seconds, they use the tools that's within Kali Linux to uh, uh, harvest a, um, a local admin uh, just with the password dictionary hacks, and it's right in the product that's free. Then once they have that, they use Mimikatz, which is a free again product, and that will decrypt and scrape a uh, privilege credential that's on that uh, server. And with that, now they own your network because they have a domain account. It's not just that it's free. It actually all comes bundled in a DVD ISO. It does. So somebody can download it as a kit and put it on their laptop and they instantly have the black hat hacker's dream. Well, the best thing is you can go to Microsoft 365, you know, buy an online server that will do this for you. Sure. Yeah, and, and download this this Kali Linux DVD, and it's got every destructive tool you ever imagined, all prepackaged. You don't even have to go looking for it. It's that easy. And unfortunately, it is. Uh, yeah, the sad truth. So we've gone past our time. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. I said there won't be any PowerPoints. Um, Vam is going to email out uh, a single slide, which is effectively just a summary of the topics that we uh, talked about today. Uh, again, I thank all of you for participating and everybody for listening in. Thanks very much. <laughs> 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 Wait for the fucking eyes to go away.